Good evening, thanks for coming out. This is my uh, first science cafe and I have to say it's a real pleasure to be here. I think I'll be a, a regular. I'm gonna be speaking to you tonight about 3D printing and some applications of that in healthcare. But before we get to the healthcare, I thought we might address a couple of broader questions like what is 3D printing and why is it interesting? Basically, 3D printing is uh, an additive manufacturing technology where you start out with nothing on your workbench and you slowly build up. You keep adding material until you have the component that you want. This is very different from traditional subtractive manufacturing technologies where you start out with a big piece of stone or metal, whatever the case may be, and you chip away at it until you've reduced its size uh, and changed its shape until you have your final product. So this offers some new and very different capabilities, this additive manufacturing techniques. Let's take a look. Uh, one could, before we delve into the details of, of how it works, let's look at a few of the things that you can print that are, I think you'll agree, are useful. Uh, and they can have some impact on your health if you're on the right side of them. A bridge, you can actually walk across this pedestrian bridge, which was 3D printed. A house, you can print a house in about a day. And I found this on the US Army website, you can actually print a grenade launcher, <laughs> which could have an impact on your health. This is an example of um, extrusion deposition printing where a house is being built with a robot that is, this is a time-lapse photography of course, where it's extruding a, um, uh, a jet of, of concrete, a couple inches in diameter, and it can print a house in a day for about $10,000. So it's a pretty interesting technology. Not only can it print concrete, it can print the insulation. In principle, it could print the copper wiring as well. So there's a lot of potential for these applications. Another technique is called liquid printing. So if you needed to print something flexible, you can start out with a big vat full of essentially jello and inject a liquid in it, which cures to become something like a flexible rubber. And here you can see an example of such a uh, structure that has been printed using a liquid printing technique. You can get all kinds of strange shapes and modulate the thickness, the amount of material, and so on. You get the idea. Another type of 3D printing is where you start out with little grains of something and you fuse them together. So in this image you can see a, basically a cookie sheet that has very fine powder of metal on it. And this metal is melted together with a laser that just moves from place to place and uh, fuses these things into something useful, like a set of gears in this uh, case. And these can be machined to an extremely uh, fine precision and they can become very strong components. All very different approaches, but all additive technologies. And then there's another interesting one called photopolymerization, which is a fancy word for saying we, we take a liquid and make it hard by shining light at it. Here you can see uh, photopolymerization again in time-lapse photography where there's a laser pointing upwards from underneath into a vat of, of basically uh, uh, a, a liquid and by shining the laser in the right place at the right time and in close proximity to what you've already printed, you can build up a three-dimensional structure. It's quite complex and that would be impossible to make with subtractive manufacturing technologies. So now that we know what 3D printing is, or at least we have some idea, uh, that was by no means comprehensive, um, but we can now look to some of the applications of it in healthcare, education, uh, for example, uh, and learning anatomy for medical students. I think we've got a few um, uh, students planning to attend med school here. Uh, anatomy is very complex. Learning it from a book in two dimensions or on a computer screen 
uh, in two dimensions is somehow not quite the same. So being able to print up anatomical components as instructional tools has proven to be quite useful and effective. There's another application which uh, we'll call roughly intraoperative applications, and these are nothing more than tools, for example, that surgeons might use in the operating theater. Perhaps it's a better surgical instrument, and perhaps it's a, a jig or a holding device to hold the instrument during the operation. But the three examples that I'll give you in the next few uh, slides are the printing of replacement parts, and these can include prostheses. By that I mean an inanimate, not living uh, replacement part that either fulfills some function or provides some appearance for the benefit of the patient. We can also print uh, tissues and very simple organs. This can also be used as a to print diagnostic tools. You might have heard of a laboratory on a chip. A few years ago that research area became very popular. Well, there's now a whole bunch of research labs around the world working on building organs on a chip. Similarly, we can look at another class of uh, applications for procedural simulation. So if there's a complicated treatment or diagnostic procedure that needs to be done, um, quite often it's beneficial to practice beforehand and being able to print up a very realistic uh, mannequin or, or dummy or phantom, whatever you want to call the, the uh, practice patient, uh, can be quite helpful in terms of assuring the highest possible quality and safety and efficiency in the actual, during the actual procedure. This is a patient who had a life-threatening cancer of the nose. Uh, the nose was amputated. And, uh, of course, this does not leave a, a terribly uh, attractive appearance. So 3D printing was used to, in really in two stages. In the first stage, a sintering technique, remember that was when we had a, a metal powder and we fused it together with a laser, that was used to, to print this bridge, or basically it's an attachment point for a silicone prosthesis. So this was also 3D printed, and it attaches via this mounting hardware here. And this is already in clinical practice. Quite exciting. This is a, another patient uh, from another patient who had a, a nose amputation from the same, same disease. So what you're seeing in this upper panel is part of a CT scan, basically going right through the center of the head. So normally you would see a nose here, but it's been amputated. And after the surgery, it's necessary to sterilize any residual cancer cells that got left behind, okay? And doing that can be quite tricky. I won't go into the reasons, but suffice it to say that one does a calculation of um, exactly how to put a radiation beam to cause a, a high radiation dose to this this area to make sure that all those cancers, any remaining cancer cells were sterilized. So what we've done in our laboratory was to take this CT scan from this patient and convert it into a set of 3D printing instructions and then we printed up a portion of the skull that would receive the radiation. And by the way, this has all the um, internal cavities and so forth in the sinus region. I can't see it now because I'm blinded, but it's on the bar there somewhere. So please, after the talk, uh, make your way over and, and pick up and feel the various uh, things that we brought for show and tell there. Uh, anyway, this allowed us to make measurements inside the uh, phantom to confirm that the planned radiation treatment was indeed uh, very well designed and was uh, delivered exactly as intended. Here's another exciting example of 3D printing that's in a, a completely different direction. Basically, the idea here is your ink is alive. It's got cells in it, so you could grow things. You could grow a cell colony, you could grow a little piece of tissue. In principle, you could even grow a whole organ 
for example, as, as a replacement. So the idea here is you have uh, biologic cells in some sort of a liquid, and you print this onto some sort of a, you know, a fancy cookie sheet, cookie sheet essentially. And the problem here has always been, um, in order to print this, the ink has to be liquid, and in order for this thing not to just be a puddle, it has to be semi-solid. So prior to uh, a paper that was actually just released this week, um, the, the ink basically hardened inside the nozzle and these things would clog up. So anyway, these researchers in Japan figured out a way to um, print this and have the liquid turn into a gel using a, a vaporized hydrogen peroxide Never mind the details, it works and 90% of the cells survive the printing process. So this is a very promising breakthrough in the area of bioprinting. I mentioned before uh, organs on a chip. And what I meant was an example, uh, like here you can see an example of a very, very simple organ. It's got a couple of different cell types shown in different colors. And these different cell types have different functions, different needs, different wants. And they're in communication with other parts of this rather simplistic organ. And the, uh, while this is simplistic, that's quite often exactly what researchers need is a very simple model to try out new things like uh, an experimental drug. The hope is that one day this type of a research tool might even replace the animal models, so the use of animals in testing out new drugs and, and other medical procedures. There's a number of groups working on hooking a number of organs on a chip together in a system that shares blood, gases, nutrients, other things, so that they can study how all of these organs work together as a total organism. It's very exciting research. In our lab, we're working on printing phantoms for radiation therapy, mostly to confirm that the radiation dose can be delivered to the tumor and it can be uh, avoided in all of the normal healthy tissues. Here you can see a time-lapse image of a 3D uh, printer at work building one of these up. The ancillary structure you see here is just basically scaffolding so that this thing doesn't fall apart as it's being printed. You can also see that on the inside of the person there's a bunch of um, scaffolding and this allows the device to uh, uh, print a complicated shape without having it fall apart. This is uh, one of the printers at LSU. This is in the uh, uh, architecture department, right on the main quadrangle. This is Megan Moore. She's with us tonight, along with her fellow student, Margaret Carey. They've both been working on this project. Uh, Megan is a biomedical engineering student. She'll be graduating in 2021. Uh, she's doing a research project on this, and Margaret Carey is a uh, physics major. She'll be graduating in May, and she's doing our, her uh, senior research thesis uh, with us through the LSU Honors College. So we're very pleased to have both of these young ladies with us tonight and they would be um, delighted to entertain any questions uh, you may have or to converse with you about this. Um, and anyway, you can get a sense of the scale of these printers. They're really pretty impressive machines. This printer can print about a one meter cube object. So for a full size person, we typically print it in two or three pieces. This um, 3D printing project that we got involved with, uh, right from get-go, it was a big team effort. And I'd like to call out the three students who've put in the most time and effort on this, Andy Halloran, who's graduated in 2016, Megan and Margaret, who I've just mentioned, as well as a large number of uh, faculty colleagues at LSU, Pennington, uh, Mary Bird Perkins Cancer Center, and elsewhere who've contributed to this effort, as well as uh, LSU, ORED, and others who've provided seed funding to get this uh, research program off the ground. So thanks very much for your attention. I'd be glad to uh, entertain any questions you may have.